Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Bob Abbey. I'm an adult services librarian for the city of Forest Grove and uh, very pleased to have you all joining us here tonight on Facebook and YouTube for uh, our presentation with uh, Nick Bucola and the fire is upon us. James Baldwin, William F. Buck Jr. and the debate over race in America. Uh, a little housekeeping before we get started while everybody is convening. Uh, just a reminder, this is a live stream program. Uh, you can participate on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, this is interactive, so please feel free to ask questions or post comments at any point during the program. And um, while we're getting started, it would be great to know who's with us tonight. So if you want to drop a first name and let us know where you're watching from, that would be awesome. Um, we know that we've got folks in our service area in Washington County, but I know that we've also got folks from around the Willamette Valley and also uh, even points farther south. So it would be great to know who's watching us tonight. Um, as we get ready, uh, I want to remind you about a couple of upcoming uh, events, or actually one. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we're very pleased to uh, welcome Walida Emerisha, uh, Walida poet, educator, public scholar, and the director of the Center for Black Studies at Portland State. And she's going to be um, talking about why there aren't more black people in Oregon. This is her hidden history presentation. Many of you have seen her before and know that this is a really powerful and important discussion. So uh, we hope you can join us on Tuesday, February 23rd at 630. Um, I want to mention too that our program tonight is made possible in part by a grant from Oregon Humanities, uh, which is a statewide nonprofit organization and an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which funds Oregon Humanities grant program. Now, for over 50 years, Oregon Humanities has offered programs and publications that help Oregonians connect, reflect, learn from one another and we've been very fortunate to have partnered with Oregon Humanities uh, a number of times over the past couple of years and they are, are doing great stuff. I should also mention that we received additional funding for this program from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and also the Oregon Cultural Trust. Now as part of that funding Oregon Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts have asked that we collect some feedback from participants. And um, I'm going to be posting a link uh, in a little bit to an online survey that we've put together. You can access that at bit.ly forward slash Baldwin Feedback. That's bit.ly forward slash Baldwin. It's very short. It'll take about one or two minutes. We've got a couple of questions just to kind of find out um, where you're located, um, how you found out about this program, and something interesting you learned. And then some questions at the bottom that are directed to the granting agency. So um, we'll have that uh, form available for 24 hours. So if you between now and 6.30 tomorrow night, if you can take a minute or two and fill that out, that would be great. And again, I'll post the link in the comments section and I'll remind you at the end of the program uh, to fill that out. So we are very fortunate to uh, have with us tonight uh, Dr. Nicholas Bacola, who is the Elizabeth and Morris Glicksman Chair in Political Science at Linfield University in McMinnville, Oregon. Um, Nick has taught courses on a variety of topics, including African-American political thought, law, rights, and justice. And he's also taught a course that looks at the political philosophy of Frederick Douglass and James Baldwin. Uh, his scholarly articles have appeared in such publications as American Political Thought, Journal of Jurisprudence, 
Quarterly Journal of Ideology and the Journal of Social Philosophy. And he's also contributed to Counterpunch, Salon, Baltimore Sun, Descent Magazine, and the New York Times. Um, his 2013 book, The Political Thought of Frederick Douglass, was a finalist for the Oregon Best Book Award. He's edited two volumes, uh, both uh, which were published in 2016, Abraham Lincoln and Liberal Democracy, and also a collection of essays, speeches, and autobiographical writings of Frederick Douglass called The Essential Douglass. Both of those came out in 2016. Uh, he recently uh, contributed a chapter on James Baldwin's Politics of Freedom for a political companion to James Baldwin, which was published in 2017. And his 2019 book, The Fire is Upon Us, was shortlisted for the Museum of African American History's Stone Book Award in 2020. Here's a copyright here. Tonight's topic is the very famous debate that took place in February of 1965, February 18th, 1965, in fact, when the Cambridge Union Society hosted a televised debate between novelist, poet, playwright, and activist James Baldwin and conservative intellectual William F. Buckley. Uh, Nick's book talks about that event, but it also presents a, a, a very interesting kind of dual biography of these two towering figures who represent different ends of the spectrum as relating to the civil rights movement. Um, once Nick is done with his presentation, we have another guest, Dr. Paul Snell, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and Government at uh, Pacific University. Uh, they'll come on and have uh, a conversation, and then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. So please, if you have questions or comments, post those in the comment section. I'll be monitoring those when I go off camera, and uh, we'll come back in and share some of those at the end of the evening. So I'm going to bring Nick into the stream. Hi, Nick. Hey, hey. How's it going, Bob? Well, great. Welcome. We're so pleased to have you with us tonight. Uh, to talk about this uh, fascinating uh, event in February of 1965 uh, that still has resonance with us today. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, your discussion, not only of the debate, also of these two towering figures who, as I said in my intro, represented different uh, points on the spectrum in the civil rights movement. So I'm going to step aside. If you're ready to share your screen out, I'll make sure yeah. that that gets up. Uh, uh, and sense. and then um, once you're done with that, I will uh, decide. There we go. All right. How's that? Right. That looks great. And then when you're done, I'll come back in and bring Paul in, and we'll move on to the next section. All right. Excellent. Take care, thanks, Nick. Bob. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, th thank you so much for that generous introduction, Bob. Uh, thank you to all the sponsors for uh, getting making this possible uh, for us to be together in this virtual format. Thank you to Paul. I'm looking forward to our conversation um, in just a little bit. One of my favorite parts of, of these events, whether they be in person or, or online, is is the opportunity to engage with with other people as they encounter this story. And um, every one of these talks I've had uh, over the months, I've learned so much from the questions that, that folks raise. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So please do, um, as, as Bob described, you can contribute questions along the way. Uh, and we'll have an opportunity for some back and forth. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of the fires upon us. Um, and and then just to kind of set up our, our conversation, um, and then I'm, we're going to have that, that conversation. I'm going to show you a couple of clips from the debate in a little while. Um, but first, I want to give you uh, the backstory, uh, which is really the heart of, of, of the book in many ways. Uh, but I want to start us out where the, the, the sort of uh, scene that Bob just described, February 18th, 1965, 56 years ago, uh, James Baldwin and William F. Buckley were in this space. This is the Cambridge Union in Cambridge, England, on the, the campus of the University of Cambridge, the world's oldest debating society. In 1965, the Cambridge Union was celebrating its 150th anniversary. So this had this this space had had seen uh, debates featuring uh, leading intellectuals, leading political figures. Um, and that night, uh, February 18th, 
um, it was absolutely packed. One of the biggest crowds the Cambridge Union had ever seen was present that night. Every single spot you can see uh, in the, the what's pictured before you was filled. Every spot on those benches, all the spaces in the galleries upstairs, those were completely filled, mostly with Cambridge students, but also with guests to the union. Um, indeed, it was so packed in there that you couldn't really see that hardwood floor uh, in front of you. That was just filled with students who were there to watch this debate. And the students were drawn there that night primarily um, by the opportunity to see James Baldwin, uh, who was in that moment one of the most famous writers in the world. Baldwin, um, as Bob just said, had written in every genre. He was a fiction writer. He was a playwright. He was an essayist. He was a journalist. Um, he was somebody who was, in the words of Malcolm X, um, the poet of the civil rights revolution. Baldwin said, my job is to bear witness to this revolution and to write it all down. Um, so that was central to who he was. He was, in, in some ways, the kind of embodiment um, of a movement. The students were also intrigued by seeing Baldwin square off against William F. Buckley Jr. They didn't know that much about Buckley. He had not got, he had not achieved international fame yet. He was on his way uh, to international fame uh, at the time Baldwin met him in 65. But Buckley was certainly famous in the United States. At that time, he was second only to Barry Goldwater as a kind of face of the burgeoning conservative movement in the United States. Buckley really was a kind of founding father of the American conservative movement. He was, in the words of one of his biographers, the St. Paul of the conservative movement. He was not somebody who was really in the business of creating ideas. He wasn't necessarily intellectually original, but he was extraordinarily important as a communicator of ideas, as a popularizer uh, of ideas, and perhaps most importantly, as a builder of a movement. So, uh, and I'll give you a sense of that in a little bit uh, of how Buckley did that. Baldwin and Buckley were in, that, were in a sense kind of embodiments of these two movements, which were in many ways clashing at this moment in history. So February 18th, 1965, they are there to debate this motion. The American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. That was the motion presented to Baldwin and Buckley that they were going to be arguing about. And just to give you a sense of the historical context, that same night, February 18, 1965, across the ocean, it, it, just outside Selma, we're in the midst of the, of the Selma campaign for voting rights. So just outside Selma in Marion, Alabama, on the night of February 18th, that was the night there was a, there was a protest march that ended in the, the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson, a 26-year-old church deacon. Those of you who've seen uh, Ava, du Ava DuVernay's fabulous film, Selma, might recall the sort of story of what happened that night in Marion. So just that gives you a sense of where we were historically. We were at the high tide of the civil rights movement, and here are Baldwin and Buckley, these embodiments of these two movements squaring off um, at the Cambridge Union, the world's oldest debating society. So high, high drama to be sure. Now, as, as Bob mentioned, the book, uh, I start you out, just as I've done um, just now to start the talk, I start you out in this space and give you a sense of the excitement of that night, this, you know, this, you know, space filled with 700 uh, students waiting to watch uh, Baldwin and Buckley and 500 more on other, in other rooms of the union premises. But then I go at, back in time. And so you have to wait another 250 pages uh, to get back um, to this space and actually reach the climactic moment in the story when these two square off. And I devote two chapters of the book to the debate itself. But really, it's a, it's a big book. It's a 400-page book because when, once I started doing the research, I realized pretty quickly that the heart of the story really was the, the two lives, these two lives, you know, James Baldwin, William F. Buckley, uh, the, the lives that they led um, just in the interest of biographies, but most of their intellectual biographies, how they came to believe what they believed. I, I wanted to weave those lives against the backdrop of the rise of these two movements that they did so much uh, respectively to shape. So I want to give you just a sense uh, before we um, engage in conversation of that story. And I, I'm going to do this in you know fairly short form and, cut and skip a lot uh, so that we can get to the conversation. And Paul and I will try to uh, you know, he'll pull on some threads that that he wants to you know pull on in in, in our conversation. Then obviously, uh, we can uh, see where where you as members of the audience want to go with the conversation uh, as well. But just to give you a sense of of Baldwin and Buckley leading up to that moment, um, Baldwin was born in August 1924 in in Harlem. And and Baldwin, you know, one of the things that's most powerful about James Baldwin, I love this interview he did late in his life. Uh, you know, so sort of in the last, you know, five or six years of his life, he's doing this interview with um, with a British uh, journalist. 
And uh, the journalist uh, begins the interview by saying, um, James Baldwin, you were born poor, black, and gay in Harlem. Did you ever think, how unlucky can I get? And uh, Baldwin has this classic response. He says, um, I thought I hit the jackpot. Um, Baldwin says that, you know, there's no, you know, I grew up the way I grew up in, in many ways, Baldwin saw later in life why his sort of status at the margins of the margins um, was so crucial to the person that he would become. And so when Baldwin describes that childhood of being at the margins in so many different ways in terms of his race, his sexuality, his economic status, um, Baldwin describes a world that in many ways dominated um, his freedom and opportunity. He describes a world in which everywhere he turned, um, he was being attacked either by, you know, sort of attacked by uh, attackers with a human face. So he talks about uh, policemen, landladies, landlords, insurance agents, uh, all the millions of details of every day that communicated to him that his life did not matter. But he also talks about something perhaps even more haunting, the ways in which he was dominated by uh, kind of what he calls bottomlessly cruel structures of power. The very structure of the society around him limited his freedom and opportunity. And so Baldwin, in his autobiographical writings, both in fiction, when he's writing uh, you know, about characters that are much like himself, and also in his nonfiction, when he's writing essays about growing up in Harlem in the 20s and 30s, um, he really tries to give us a sense of what the world looked like through his eyes, what the world looked like through the eyes of someone like his father, David Baldwin, who he says he watched over the years, his father consumed by despair. His father, he, he says, came to believe what the white world said about him. And he watched his father uh, end up losing his mind. He ends up dying in, in a, um, an institution uh, and he, he loses his mind and he, he has, his body deteriorates. And Baldwin watches his father really consumed by that despair. And Baldwin, one of the things he says is that I realized um, when I was you know, a teenager that I had to figure out a way to escape that fate. And one of the ways that Baldwin escaped that fate was through language. And so I love one of the things that's been uh, really wonderful about going around talking about the book when we, you know about pre-pandemic and then talking about the book in platforms like this is that often um, we're surrounded by books uh, when I talk about this book. And so in book bookstores and libraries and so on, because books were so important to James Baldwin. Books were central to his salvation. Language was the tool, the, the lever that Baldwin used to escape and to fight back against that, that, that those sort of forces of domination I just described. So Baldwin began reading and writing, and he even fo he followed his father in one particular way. He became a preacher, he became a young minister from the ages of 14 to 17. So Baldwin was somebody who was really taken by the power of language to connect people. Uh, across time and space and to connect people, uh, you know, when they were in the same room together, when they were communicating with each other. So Baldwin is somebody from this very young age is obsessed with language and wants to try to harness language to fight back against this world that he sees uh, in, in which he sees so much injustice around him. So Baldwin uh, is living that life in Harlem. And, and me meanwhile, William F. Buckley Jr. is living a very, very different life. And so uh, a year and a half later, a little under a year and a half later, uh, in November 1925, William F. Buckley is born in New York City. He's born in the same city as James Baldwin, but as I say in the book, they may as well have been born on different planets. Um, whereas Baldwin describes one of the char characteristic features of his life in Harlem, um, he uses the word claustrophobia a lot. He describes this sort of feeling of being in a space where he's sharing a room, sharing even a bed with several of his siblings. Baldwin was one of nine kids. Um, and he says, if you sort of imagine being in a bed with several of your siblings in a room with all the windows shut, a small room with all the windows shut, Baldwin says that gives you a sense of the claustrophobia I experience. Buckley, when he describes his childhood, describes seemingly limitless space. Most of his childhood is spent um, at a 47-acre estate known as Great Elm. Um, and Ball Buckley is, is in this extraordinarily wealthy family. His father was a, a real estate and oil uh, magnate who had made, lost, and regained fortunes by the time uh, William F. Buckley Jr. was born. And his mother uh, came from, from old money in New Orleans. She was a self-described proud daughter of the Confederacy. So Buckley is awash in money and his parents were, uh, they provided a very nice lifestyle for their, for their 10 children. They had this wonderful estate. 
uh, where they had servants attending to, to every need. Um, they also had live-in tutors. The, the, the Buckley children were homeschooled. Uh, and they had their own kind of liberal arts institution right there at the estate. Um, they were taught every subject under the sun. I mean, go through the wonderful catalog of courses offered by Pacific University or, or Linfield University. And all those subjects were being taught to the Buckley children. Um, but more importantly than the sort of the most important of those subjects were they were taught a particular worldview, both by their parents and by these tutors who were brought in by their parents to teach them. And that worldview really had two major pillars that are central to this story and, and sort of what sets up uh, Buckley's eventual clash with Baldwin. One is that the Buckleys were, um, were staunch Catholics. They had a particular brand of Catholicism that was central to their worldview. But more importantly for our purposes, they had a particular moral and political doctrine that they called individualism. That was a kind of catch-all term for the Buckleys. And individualism uh, as a term, as an idea, was meant to capture their hostility to any form of collectivism. So they were deeply anti-communist, they were deeply anti-socialist. They were deeply anti-FDR and the New Deal policies of, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They were deeply opposed to those. Um, and they were also suspicious of democracy. Um, the Buckleys were taught that some people are fit to rule and others are fit to be ruled. And good news, Buckley children, you are all fit to rule. So that was a kind of central idea and unabashed elitism uh, was, was part of Buckley's upbringing. And that elitism was thoroughly racialized in the Buckley household. I mentioned that Buckley's parents, Buckley's mother was a proud daughter of the Confederacy. Um, his father was also a Southerner of, of a different sort. He was a Texan. But both of them, by almost any description, Buckley and his generation, Buckley Jr. and his generation would admit their parents were racist. They, were, they believed in a kind of natural racial hierarchy but they taught their children that that natural racial hierarchy imposed on them certain obligations. So this was a particular kind of racism, and this distinction mattered a lot to William F. Buckley Jr. He said, our parents taught us to not, not to have animus toward those who were beneath us. Uh, in fact, they taught us to have, to have a sense of obligation to take care of those beneath us, especially those who were loyal. That was a central part of the Buckley worldview. And you can imagine how that ends up being absolutely crucial to his encounter with Baldwin. Um, I want to just say, I'm going to kind of go past these next couple slides fairly quickly um, because I really want to highlight uh, the sort of back and forth between Buckley and Baldwin on race. Um, in particular, uh, and so so I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the the sort of um, lead up to to the real sort of engagement that each of them have with questions of race and civil rights uh, in the 50s and 60s. And the major thing I want to say about sort of young William F. Buckley Jr. once he leaves um, his parents uh, and he goes on to Millbrook Prep School and he serves for two years in the U.S. Army uh, and then he ends up at Yale. And this is a picture of him at Yale when he is chairman of the Yale Daily News is what they, they call the sort of editor in chief of the student newspaper. And the, the important thing to know just about Buckley in these years and sort of the late 40s, early 50s, is that Buckley is somebody who is absolutely positively devoted to the, the mission of defending that worldview that his parents taught him against all comers. So he did things like he broke into you know, the faculty meeting un, uninvited uh, at his prep school to lecture his teachers about the, all the, you know, the wrongness of their religious and political views. When he was at Yale, he did things like write editorials uh, not only commenting on international and, and domestic politics, but co commenting on his professors. Paul and I, you know, you know, sort of, we, we make sure our students don't get any ideas here. They he would they would write he would write essays about how his professors were uh, were engaged in this nefarious work of um, converting Christian individualist students uh, into atheistic socialists. So Buckley is somebody who's um, through the the newspaper through student debate. Um, he is proudly defending that worldview that his parents taught him. And he even goes on after he graduates from Yale uh, to author a book length indictment of his alma mater, uh, God and Man at Yale. Uh, one day, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, there's not some student who writes, you know, God and Man at Linfield or God and Man at Pacific. But um, this is a book in which Buckley uh, indicts not only Yale, but most institutions of higher education for indoctrinating students with the wrong ideas. It's important to know Buckley was not against indoctrinating students. What he was against is indoctrinating students with the wrong ideas. So he said, what we need is we need boards of trustees and, uh, and alumni to exert more control over who is hired, 
who is fired and what is being taught. And he hoped that institutions like Yale would, would teach uh, these sort of Christian and individualist values that he was taught growing up. If that wasn't controversial enough, Buckley's second book, uh, which was published in the early 1950s, was called McCarthy and His Enemies, and it was a book-length defense of Joseph McCarthy, that, who was leading uh, the, the latest Red Scare in the country. In that book, Buckley sort of follows one of the themes that was in God and Man at Yale. The basic argument of both books is that it's necessary for society to impose a public orthodoxy, a particular orthodoxy. There needs to be certain things that are thought by most people in the society, and there needs to be other ideas that are excluded in any way possible from the society in order for the society to, to survive. And so th that's what Buckley is doing in these early years uh, as he's getting started arriving on the intellectual scene. Um, meanwhile, uh, James Baldwin is arriving on the intellectual scene uh, it, it, at the late 1940s, early 1950s, right around the same time. So Baldwin left the United States. Um, he felt that he could not survive if he stayed in the United States. He saw his father consumed by despair. His father dies in 1943. In 1946, uh, Baldwin uh, watches one of his best friends, a guy named Eugene Wirth, uh, who's this young idealist. Uh, Eugene Wirth is somebody who's so consumed by despair, he ends up taking his own life. And Baldwin recognizes that there's a kind of way in which his life could go in, in one of those directions. He sees the ways in which despair might uh, actually you know, uh, destroy his own life or lead him to destroy the lives of others. And so he leaves the United States in order to write about the United States. He says, I couldn't really write about my experiences in Harlem. He really wanted to write an autobiographical novel uh, about those experiences. He said, I realized I couldn't do it while I was here. I had to leave and have some critical distance to do that, that sort of work. And Baldwin uh, is setting out, he says a little bit later, that his goal was to figure out what it meant to be an honest man and a good writer and the relationship between those two things. And so Baldwin it devotes himself to that and he does that through writing, first of all, a lot of book reviews. He reads the works of others to figure out what it means to be an honest man and a good writer. And then he works on that novel and works on that novel and eventually gets it published. Go Tell on the Mountain is its name. Everybody should read it. And it's a reflection about a set of characters that are a lot like Baldwin and his family. He wants to understand um, the lives of those characters from the inside. And so Baldwin, uh, you know, that's what he's doing in both his fiction and his nonfiction. Baldwin is obsessed um, with trying to get his reader, trying to give his reader a sense of what the world looks like through the eyes of others. That is what uh, he wants to do, whether he's writing, uh, you know, a short story, a novel, or if he's writing a nonfiction piece, if he's doing uh, some journalistic work, he wants to try to give us a sense of what the world looks like through the eyes of other people, especially people who have different uh, experiences from what we have. So Baldwin is obsessed with that. And he's really obsessed with the kind of question of identity is what he calls it. He wants to know, he's asking this question, who do we think we are, right? Who do we take ourselves to be as individuals? Who do we take ourselves to be as members of groups? And how does that sort of question of identity lead us to treat other people? And so Baldwin is, is, is doing that and goes on the mountain with his family, much like his own in Harlem. His second novel, Giovanni's Room, um, is a novel that he has a really hard time getting published. And the reason is um, he, he brings the, the book to the publisher of, of his first novel and says, I have another book. Um, and they say, uh, in effect, um, Jimmy, why are you handing us this all white gay novel is what it, one of his publishers called it. Um, you are a promising young Negro writer is what this publisher says to Baldwin. You're gonna ruin your career. Uh, Giovanni's Room is a story of a white American, David, who travels to Paris and falls in love with an Italian bartender uh, there. And the story of their kind of affair is the center of that novel. And Baldwin uh, was obviously, this was published in 1956. You can imagine how controversial that book was. Baldwin, um, his response is that really what interests him um, is you know questions of race, questions of homophobia, questions of, of sexual identity uh, and racial identity are, are part of, of, the, of those novels. But he says, really what my, my, these stories are about are they're about fr the freedom and f what does it look like for a human being to achieve freedom and fulfillment? And what are the obstacles to freedom and fulfillment for human beings? That is what Baldwin is obsessed with. And he wants to figure out how that question of identity, that question of what we take, who we take ourselves to be, is related to that goal of achieving freedom and fulfillment. And so that's really Baldwin's obsession as he's kind of getting his uh, arriving on the intellectual scene as a writer in the 40s and, and early and mid 50s. Um, now, 
uh, Buckley sort of finds his niche, his niche. You know, he, he's writing these books and they're doing quite well, and he's a right. You know, people are noticing him, um, but he 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 hasn't really figured out exactly where he's going to fit in the cultural and political landscape. He he well, he likes writing books, but he, he's frustrated by the glacial pace of book publishing. And so what he really wants is, is he wants a magazine of his own. He tries to work for another magazine, but he was not cut out to be anyone's employee. So that lasts about four months. Remember, there are some people who are fit to rule and others who are fit to be ruled. Buckley was fit to rule. So he wants a magazine of his own. And, and um, this is something Paul and I might talk about. In American political culture, um, magazines have played a really important role, especially in the early 20th century. Uh, magazines on the left, like the New Republic of the Nation, played a really important role in the shaping of the American progressive movement. And so Buckley wants to utilize uh, a magazine to kind of help make a conservative movement. And that's what he tries to do in the mid 50s. He, he sort of starts the process of launching a magazine in 1954 and eventually launches National Review with its first issue in November of 1955. And through this magazine, he's really trying to shape a movement, trying to bring a coalition of different groups on the American right together because there wasn't anything like a coherent conservative movement at the time. So he's getting libertarians and traditionalists and other folks, anti-communists, to come together under one banner, even though they didn't agree on everything, he said, we can agree on what we don't like. We don't like communism. We don't like liberalism. And so one of the big questions in this period is what is Buckley going to have to say about race and civil rights? Using this magazine as this kind of vehicle to help create a conservative movement, um, Buckley plays a really important role in shaping American conservatism all the way down to today. Now, it's important to note that Buckley, when he's making this, these decisions, it's not a foregone conclusion that someone founding a conservative magazine in 1955 would uh, choose the path that Buckley chose. It was, it was necessary for the magazine to weigh in on these issues, of course, because 54 and 55, right in the years when Buckley is, is, is launching the magazine, we had the Brown v. Board school desegregation decision, the tremendous white backlash against that decision, uh, from the White Citizens Councils and, and others. Um, we had the lynching of Emmett Till, which of course got international headlines. We had the arrest of Rosa Parks, the Montgomery bus boycott, the rise of this 26 year old minister, Martin Luther King, uh, and so on. All that's happening when Buck was launching the magazine. And there were some conservatives, conservative Republicans, uh, especially who thought of themselves as friendly to civil rights. But Buckley chooses another course and that has major consequences for us down to today. Buckley uh, and the magazine are resistant on just about every turn. So they make it very clear they're against the Brown v. Board school desegregation decision. They're against any federal intervention to interfere with segregation, period, whether it's by the courts or by Congress. Um, they are calling people like Strom Thurmond in the book, lower left of your screen, a latter day Patrick Henry, who's, uh, who's part of another American revolution. Um, Buckley is defending all of these. Um, so just to give you a sense of the outcomes, right, he ends up being the magazine is critical of Martin Luther King at just about every turn. The only exception is economic boycotts. They think that's a legitimate form of social protest. Um, they are against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, against the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They are critical of the Freedom Riders. They are critical of the sit-in protests. Buckley says 10 years after the launch of the magazine that his goal on race and civil rights was for the magazine to be extremely articulate, non-racist, but not reflexively racially egalitarian. So he was trying to walk this really fine line between racism and, and and being and sort of being a critic of racial egalitarianism, you can imagine how fine a line that was. But what he really wanted was basically an intellectual defense of everything his parents ever taught him about race. Right? He wanted to defend a kind of racial hierarchy that was not rooted in animus, but was rather rooted in a sense of noblesse oblige, a sense of obligation to those beneath him. And that was really what he did through a variety of different writers. And um, I don't have time to talk about these various people pictured here, but if you want to hear more about that kind of the backstory of Buckley's defense of, um, of this intransigence on civil rights, um, we should definitely uh, revisit some of the details of this because it's, it's quite fascinating and important. One of the things that was most remarkable to me as I worked on the book was the moment, you know, I, I go for about 20 pages in the book and really do this deep dive into Buckley and his circle on race and civil rights, because I really wanted to give readers a sense uh, 
of how they were seeing the world and how they were understanding the world and how they were defending their position. I wanted to let them speak for themselves. Um, and then right at that same moment, when Buckley and his crew are sort of rationalizing their defense of white supremacy, rationalizing their resistance of black liberation, it's right in the same two or three week period when Buckley's really doing some of his most important writing on those subjects that James Baldwin is returning to the United States. In the summer of 1957, Baldwin comes back because he feels obligation to bear witness to the revolution that's occurring. And, he, and so just you know, to go from Buckley in a circle in New York, justifying their positions, to Baldwin sitting in the living room of a 15-year-old young man named Gus Roberts, who's the first African-American student at a previously all-white high school. Baldwin is sitting in this living room, looking into Gus's eyes, trying to trying to give us a sense of what those uh, what it was like to look through those eyes uh, on the second day of school as Gus is walking toward the front of the school and he sees his white classmates arm in arm forming a human barricade meant to keep him out of school. He, he wants to hear from Gus what it's like to have been subjected to verbal and physical assaults on a regular basis in this new school. And Baldwin he says, I wanna know what it's like for Gus to confront what is surely the most difficult moment in his day, the morning when he wakes up and realizes it all has to be gone through again. So that's the kind of thing Baldwin is doing. He wants to get inside of Gus Roberts' head and give us a sense of what that looks like. He wants to get inside of Gus's mother's head, right? Gus's mother is one of only a few dozen African-American parents in, in a, a city, Charlotte, North Carolina, that you know had 50, over 50,000 African-American people. She's one of only a few days and a dozen parents who even applied for this integration program. So Baldwin wants to understand her. How did she have the courage, the audacity uh, to, to, to make that decision? Baldwin even wants to give us a sense of what it's like, what the world looks like through the eyes of the white principal of Gus's school, right? This is someone who's been taught from you know, the earliest age to believe in racial hierarchy. And now he's in this position where he has one African-American student in his school. And part of his obligation now is to make sure that Gus is safe. What does the world look like through the eyes of that white principal? That's the sort of work that Baldwin is doing. So Baldwin goes from, from that, sort of, that sort of work um, to, and I would say this is true of Baldwin and Buckley in the sort of late 50s, um, they are sort of clearly arriving on the intellectual scene. But in the early 60s, uh, without a doubt, they are more and more at the, in the eye of the political storm. So Baldwin is, is sort of still playing this kind of witness role, this poet role in the civil rights revolution, but he's also becoming more and more of an activist, right? He's engaged in the work of trying to bring about uh, racial justice. And Buckley, meanwhile, is engaged in the work of trying to take these conservative ideas and put them in a position of power. So he is doing things like uh, commenting on the rise of somebody like George Wallace and trying to figure out how conservatives can benefit from the sort of white backlash that Wallace is, is tapping into. He's championing the, the candidacy of Barry Goldwater picture here as well. And so, the, so Baldwin and Buckley in the early 60s and the mid 60s leading up to the debate, they are each without question identified as among the most prominent figures in their respective movements. And that's why, one of the reasons why there's so much drama leading up into this moment, this international event really of a, an international television audience is gonna see James Baldwin, poet of the civil rights revolution, squaring off against William F. Buckley Jr. on this international stage. What I'm gonna do now is just play a couple short clips and then uh, Paul and I will, will have our conversation. Um, and I just wanna give you a sense of a little bit of Baldwin speech and a little bit of Buckley's, just a couple minutes of each, um, and uh, and then we'll go from there. So here is James Baldwin again. The motion before the House is the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro, uh, and here is Mr. Baldwin. The flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. <laughs> the disaffection, the demoralization, and the gap between one person and another, only on the basis of the color of their skins, begins there and accelerates 
accelerates throughout a whole lifetime. So that presently you realize you're 30. And are having a terrible time managing to trust your countrymen. By the time you are 30, you have been through a certain kind of mill. And the most serious effect of the mill you've been through is again, not the catalog of disaster. The policemen, the taxi drivers, the waiters, the landlady, the landlord, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. It is not that. It's by that time you begin to see it happening in your daughter or your son or your niece or your nephew. All right. So we could listen to Baldwin all night, but I'll just stop uh, there. Um, and, and just, you know, just to give you a little taste, if you've not watched the debate, the BBC recording of the debate, um, I, if, you know, if you get nothing else out of this experience tonight, definitely go watch uh, the debate. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So that gives you a sense of Baldwin's, um, how Baldwin approaches it. He really is there as a kind, he says, I'm here as a kind of Jeremiah. I'm here to deliver a sermon uh, to this, this predominantly white elite audience. I'm here to deliver a sermon about white supremacy. So we can sort of trace out in more detail uh, the sorts of arguments that Baldwin makes that night in our conversation. Um, but Baldwin goes on for 24 minutes and gets a standing ovation, which is a very rare thing at the Cambridge Union. Uh, and then William F. Buckley Jr. has his chance to say his piece. And here's a little bit of Buckley. Oops. Sorry. his flagellations of our civilization that indeed are quite properly are commands the contempt which he so eloquently showers upon us. But it is impossible in my judgment uh, to deal with the indictment of Mr. Baldwin unless one is prepared to deal with him as a white man. Unless one is prepared to say to him the fact that your skin is black is utterly irrelevant to the arguments that you raise. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you sit here as is your rhetorical device uh, and lay the entire weight of the Negro ordeal on your own shoulders uh, is irrelevant to the argument that we are here to discuss. The gravamen of Mr. Baldwin's charges against America or not so much that our civilization has failed him and his people, that our ideals are insufficient, but that we have no ideals, that our ideals rather are some sort of a superficial coating uh, which we come up with at any given moment in order to justify uh, whatever commercial and noxious experiment we are engaged in. Uh, thus, uh, Mr. Baldwin can write his book, The Fire Next Time, uh, in which he threatens America. Uh, he didn't, in writing that book, speak with the British accents that he used exclusively tonight, but in which he threatened America with the necessity uh, for us to uh, jettison, uh, for us to jettison our entire civilization. The only thing that the white man has the Negro should want, he said, is power. All right, so uh, so that is a little bit of Buckley's speech. And again, we can talk more about Buckley's uh, rhetorical strategy that night and, and some of the other arguments uh, that he makes. Um, after Buckley sits down, he gets polite applause, not a standing ovation, and the, the students um, vote. And uh, the way the Cambridge Union voted is students would walk out one door or another, depending on which side they thought uh, won the debate, and Baldwin's side, spoiler alert, won handily. The vote was 544 to 164. Um, and so I, I have an initial chapter in the book at, that sort of covers the aftermath of the debate, because a lot happened later in 65 um, that's really important to this story, and I try to draw out some of the legacies of the debate and this argument between Baldwin and Buckley uh, as well in the epilogue. So we can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like. But for now, I'm going to stop uh, talking and I'm gonna stop sharing and then Paul um, will uh, Paul and Bob will come up here and we will have some conversation. Thank you for your attention
I think you're you're muted, Bob. There we go. Okay. Uh, hi, Paul. Hi, Nick. Uh, so um, a little bit about Paul. We're very pleased to have uh, him join us tonight. Uh, Paul is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and Government at Pacific University. Um, he uh, teaches courses on uh, presidency and Congress and constitutionalism. I think you have both of those classes uh, this, this term, in fact, right? Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Um, and he also focuses on research around themes of power, uh, representation, and the politics of difference. Um, so in many ways, I feel like Paul is ideal for uh, helping bring this conversation into a, a, a wonderful focus. Um, I'm going to step out of the stream and let Nick and Paul uh, have a conversation. Uh, this is your opportunity. Please remind you that um, you can post your comments and questions. I'll continue to monitor those when I'm off screen, and we'll have some time at the end of the evening to uh, read those. So um, take this opportunity to do that. And um, gentlemen, I'll see you at the end. All right, take care, Bob. Hey, Nick, how you doing? <laughs> I'm great, Paul. I'm excited to chat. Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, so, you know, before we get into it, I uh, definitely have to do a plug for the book. So Bob wasn't able to hold up, I think, the book, but I have my copy with all of the tabs. Um, it's definitely a delightful read. And I think that the book does a fabulous job of really setting the context of these people, as you described, who are not quite central figures to these movements. You know, we're not talking about Martin Luther King. We're not talking about Bill Connor, right? We're talking about people who are very much, I won't say in the periphery, but in the mix, right? And so I think as a result, we're able to get a really interesting take on the way that they're able to see the events. So I think the book does a fabulous job of giving us context around not only them, but also what they're coming through. And so brief plug, of course, you know, please do check out and really see, you know, how their lives really operate. But then also one of the things I think was really cool was you really get a sense of how these people think. So you begin to see like during the debate itself, their strategies and the way that they approach the world and the way they think really comes through throughout the book. So long way saying, check it out. <laughs> but what I want to do for our real sadly brief time, because I was telling Bob, you know, we're professors, we could do this all day, is um, I really want to hone in on the things that they talk about in the debate, right? So really kind of unpacking this. I think when we get into discussion, you know, we really want to take the enduring lessons from the debate forward. Mm -hmm. So starting with that, um, with Baldwin, the first thing that stuck to my stuck out to me was the Jeremiah, right? And I'm glad you played that part of the clip. And you know, Baldwin described himself as a type of Jeremiah. And you say this in the book. Um, and sadly, if you know your Bible or not, you know Jeremiah was a prophet who had things to say but knew he wouldn't be heard simultaneously, right? So, uh, you know, would you talk to us a little bit more about kind of Baldwin as a type of Jeremiah, both? And this obviously is a tie into his religious background, of course, but then also um, the limits that he seem, that he thinks that he has. Yeah, great, great question, Paul. Um, I'm so yeah, so so excited to to chat with you about about the, the, this book and and the story. Um, yeah, so I mean Baldwin, I think that's you know the, the thing about you know and Jeremiah um, is somebody who was important to Baldwin, you know, in in terms of um, his own. You know, his, his sort of religious identity, as you mentioned, was is a complicated story, right? Um, sort of the Baldwin's relationship to uh, to his faith and the faith of his father and so on is a really long story that we can't really get into. But yeah, I think there's a kind of this moment, there's something about him announcing himself as a Jeremiah um, that really captures precisely what you just said of the this sort of idea that he knows that he has a message that people don't want to hear and that they might, they're probably unwilling to hear, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so Baldwin in this moment, you know, it's it's a really extraordinary thing and that for there for a lot of reasons in February, 1965, Baldwin should have been feeling relatively triumphant, right? Um, you know, you have the, the sort of the victory, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you have the landslide victory of LBJ over Goldwater and, and the sort of civil rights issue was, was central. Um, and there's sort of reasons why, you know, he should feel like momentum is on his side. And yet, um, here he is at the Cambridge Union announcing himself as this kind of Jeremiah. And, and in part, I think that what he's doing in that kind of prophetic role mm 
is Baldwin is always there to say yes, but, right? So even in these moments of triumph, whether it's an electoral triumph or a judicial decision or a piece of legislation, he's always there to sort of remind us of, of what the world looks like from the margins, right? And to, and to sort of not let anyone off the hook. So I think that's central to what he's doing there. Um, but also he's really still convinced that the soul of the country is still sick. Um, he, he recognizes there has been some political victories and he's, he's pleased about that um, on some level, right? Insofar as they go, but he still feels, and this is where the, the speech is so powerful in the way he structures it, um, and that he still feels that the the kind of uh, white supremacy is still has a grip on on you know not only American culture but he puts it in a global context right and he talks about the ways in which white supremacy is having an impact not only on the what he calls the subjugated in the speech but also the subjugators right in some ways he's implicitly calling out Buckley and saying you are still in the grip of white supremacy and that is destroying your soul. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I, that's kind of how I, I sort of read the Jeremiah thing is that he knows that he still has a message, even in this moment of triumph, that people don't quite want to accept. And that becomes a weird tension for Buckley later, because, of course, he starts off with, you know, Buckley kind of implying to Baldwin, you know, how dare you say that you don't have a stage, right? You just got a saying ovation the first time at Cameron Union. You know, basically the event is a PR event for Baldwin and Buckley was brought on later. That's why Buckley's saying, well, how can you possibly say there's been no progress, which is something that Buckley obviously gets to and we'll talk about. But I do want to spend a lot more time unpacking Baldwin's fundamental diagnosis of the problem in America. Yeah. Because for him, racism is kind of a gloss for what he identifies, you say, uh, two real fundamental problems, status anxiety and pluralism. Can you talk to us a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, Baldwin... You know his diagnosis, right? He cuts. He he goes. You know he goes deep, right? He wants. To, he's he's trying to get a sense of Baldwin's always interested in these universal questions. One of the, the characterizations of, of Baldwin that I just love is uh, from the the writer uh, Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, who says if if Baldwin was a basketball player and, and he had a signature move, you know, we call it the Jimmy, and the Jimmy would be, you know, in, in terms of as a writer would be this Baldwin's ability to go really deep into a particular and then pan back to the universal and then come right back down to the particular. And so, yeah, I think when Baldwin is thinking through, um, you know, questions of, you know, American racial politics, when he's thinking through questions of sexual identity, um, he, he tries to get at uh, what he thinks is the, is the core of these things, right? Why is it that human beings are constantly othering and constantly marginalizing? And, and I think that these two ideas that you get at status anxiety and, and pluralism are, are central to his explanation, especially in the American context. I mean, basically Baldwin's story is this. He says, Americans are, you know, for a variety of reasons, and, you know, we could talk about Tocqueville and all sorts of things and other diagnoses of this sort, but he says Americans are, you know, in this this kind of democratic context, that democratic in some, in the broadest sense possible, um, the, the, the Americans are sort of, you know, um, longing for a sense of place, of where they belong, where they fit. And so Baldwin says that one of the things that we try to do as we're constructing our identity and we're constantly reconstructing our identity is that we tend, we're fundamentally scared, right? And what we're looking for is an identity, a sense of self that makes us feel safe. And so one of the things that he says we do is we lean on this idea of status. We try to figure out how to position ourselves, who we are in relation to other people. And in particular, what's gonna make us feel safe if we feel more powerful than other people, right? And so we're, we're constantly engaged in that work of, of, of sort of constructing an identity that will make us feel safe. And this idea of status anxiety, right, that Baldwin diagnoses so, so beautifully, and of course has been written about by a lot of other um, authors since, is that we, we, even when those moments when we feel a little bit safe because we made ourselves feel superior to another, we are haunted by the fact that someone out there is feeling superior to us. And we know that we're going to slip, you know, that, that sort of the ladder of status is a slippery one. And we're going to feel we know how close we are um, to falling off that ladder. And so, so I think that's really central to what Baldwin's up to. And he says that that's the sort of central function, you know, of... Um, of you know race in American American culture, right? Is that race has been central to um, the kind of construction of a particular kind of identity? And he says in the speech at Cambridge and in many other places, right? 
There are people who are the only thing that the thing that they're clinging to to give them sense uh, to give themselves a sense of self, a sense of value in the world is their whiteness. Is this this idea, this identity of whiteness is the one thing they have. And Baldwin says, what could be more sad than that, right? That's the one thing that they're hanging on to to make themselves feel like they have meaning and place in the world. And so that is really central. And Baldwin has, a, you know, he does some similar things with his reflections on, on um, you know, sexual identity and the ways in which we use sexual identity to sort of, uh, you know, make ourselves feel superior to others. So, um, you know, I think that's that, that lens, right, is something Baldwin gives us. It's extraordinarily powerful to view a lot of human problems and basic human, you know, uh, challenges that each of us have as individuals and also in, in a social and political sense. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's kind of that's kind of central to the Baldwin story, and I think it's one of the things that's most most powerful about him. Yeah, you alluded to it earlier, also in the talk. Could you talk a lot a bit more about what Baldwin thought was the cost of racism, not only to Black Americans but also to White Americans? I think the example of the principles what stuck out to me so much. So much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is one of the things he does so so beautifully in the speech is, uh, you know, again, the, the framing of the motion, right? The American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. It's it's fascinating. One of the things that that Baldwin kept, you know, in his archive, so in his archive, which was opened while I was in the middle of working on the book, Baldwin's archive opened in in Harlem at the Schomburg, which is just a, a magical, wonderful place. Um, the, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, one of the things Baldwin kept was he had handwritten, um, you know, on hotel stationery, little notes that he brought with him. And you can see him pull them out of his pocket and put them on the podium. He hardly looks at them at all during the speech because he was just, you know, he was, the spirit was moving him and he didn't need to look at those notes. Um, but one of the things that was fascinating about his, his little notes is that he, he did circle that word expense, right? And had these kind of, little little ideas of how he might address it and and one of the things he does beautifully in the speech is he talks about expense in a, in a variety of different ways right including the, the famous uh lines that i that are just after the clip that i played where baldwin talks about he uses he sort of personalizes the story of racial um exploitation economic ex exploitation by saying i picked the cotton i carried it to market I, you know, I built the railroads for nothing, for nothing. Um, but he also talks about the expense, to get to your question, um, he talks about the expense of white supremacy for its would-be beneficiaries, right? So he talks about the people who are, the ones who are supposed to be benefiting from this doctrine are actually being destroyed by it. And so he, he gives the really powerful example um, in in the the speech, which is the, about about the most stark example one could give in that historical moment, is he says Sheriff Jim Clark, who in that you know at that moment is being you know he's being he's on the cover of newspapers around the world, he's on television brandishing his cattle prod in in Selma and around Selma um, against men, women, and children who are fighting for their rights, and and Baldwin says think about Jim Clark. He says Jim Clark, it's easy to dismiss him as a monster. But he's not a monster. He's a human being like you and me. And he gets this kind of laugh line, right, from, the, from, from, from Jim Clark. He says, Jim Clark probably loves his wife. He probably loves his children. He probably likes to get drunk. Um, and he says, Jim Clark's life, and then Baldwin uses this really powerful phrase, you know, phrase, this term, his moral life, right, has been destroyed by the plague called color. Jim Clark's entire sense of self is, is, is rooted in this delusion of white supremacy, this delusion of whiteness. And his entire understanding of his role in the world is to protect the fortress of white supremacy. And Baldwin says, think about what that's done to the, the soul of Jim Clark, right? And he, and, but one thing, just, and I'll shut up, is, is like one thing that Baldwin writes just before um, the debate itself in the, in the, uh, the sort of show notes for Blues from Mr. Charlie, uh, Baldwin's uh, play that ran on Broadway in 64, is Baldwin has a Jim Clark-like character uh, in that in that play, and what Baldwin says is that that the character's name is Lyle Britton, and he says, you know, the, the really the fact is, uh, we probably can't save Lyle Britton's soul, but maybe we can change the soul of his kids, and that's a you know that's simultaneously a sort of um, it's a depressing and an inspiring idea, right? Baldwin is trying to say, as he does so powerfully in the clip I did play. There's this intergenerational story that he wants to tell, where he's not just talking to his audience, you know, in that case, mostly young people in the room, 
but he's also he has us looking toward the future, right? And thinking about what what we can do now to make the world better, perhaps after we're gone. And I think that's an extraordinarily powerful message that Baldwin sends. Yeah, and it becomes, you know, yeah, I think one of the really outstanding parts of that speech is just how much Baldwin really makes the humanity of racism very apparent. And I feel like in a weird way we lose that nowadays. Like I think due to some of our studies, we're very good at talking about structures and broader systems, but I think the humanity of racism and how it eats the soul, everyone's soul, is a bit lost, right? Whether it be his dad, whether it be other black people, whether it be white people, that I think that Baldwin really points that out. I think it's why he was able to captivate that audience so much because they could, they felt their own humanity expressed hmm. that way. And so that kind of leaves us, well, well, what do we do, right? Because I think Baldwin leaves us in two different places. On the one hand, he has this view of, you know, the importance of self-examination, which is important in looking within oneself, trying to tease all of this out, whether it be black or white. Um, but then also, and this is what he also talks about, the idea of freedom and becoming more of a blues people as mm -hmm. a way out. But on the other hand, to make this more complicated, he starts off the speech by saying, the way you see this question, the way you see everything is bound by your by power, who you are and what you see and what you grow mm -hmm. up with, right? And so on the one hand, we have this possibility of freedom because we can look inside of ourselves, we can examine <laughs> as much as we'd like. But then on the other hand, we're always stuck, right? This, maybe he can't be saved. So I guess kind of question is how do we, or Baldwin, how do we deal with this tension? Mm -hmm. what do we yeah, that's an easy one. No. Of course, I, I mean, we got 10 more minutes, you can do that quick. <laughs> Man, um, yeah, great question, Paul. This is, that's great. Um, yeah, and you, you captured it so beautifully. Uh, so yeah, and this is one of the things about Baldwin that is uh, that was, you know, and is right frustrating. Right, it was frustrating to his contemporaries in some some ways because because of the kind of thinker he was, the kind of writer he was. Um, he was he was a kind of I love Cornell West characterization of Baldwin as. The black American Socrates, right? Um, this idea that Baldwin and Baldwin says this, right? That the, my job, the job of the artist, the job of the poet, is to drive to the heart of every answer to expose the question that it hides, right? Um, but it doesn't, you know. But he does, also doesn't want to. I don't think Baldwin um, was just going to be uh, dodging the sort of question that you're asking, right? Of what, what, where does that leave us? What is our responsibility? And I think that Baldwin is, you know, simultaneously he has that kind of spirit, right? He has that Socratic spirit that I think is central to who he was and how he perceived his role, while at the same time, um, absolutely positively having probably the most robust sense of responsibility one can imagine, right? Because what he he ultimately tells us is that the the obligation that each of us has um, is is extraordinarily strong to try to make the world, try to make humans more better than they are, right? It's a kind of basic idea. And, and I think what Baldwin does, as you point out, and, I, and I, I, one of the things that's um, perfect is that Baldwin, you know, here we are during the week of Valentine's Day, right? And we're thinking about love. I mean, part of Baldwin's perfect. prescription <laughs> is love, right? I mean, Baldwin's prescription, um, and it's love in a very particular sense. And I, I always really try to emphasize this because there's a kind of way in which especially during Valentine's Day, this is not a Hallmark greeting cards kind of love that Baldwin is describing, right? He, he says that really what love is for Baldwin um, is an extraordinarily demanding, tough, and philosophical thing, right? And so as you point out, Paul, part of that is this kind of ruthless introspection that he wants all of us to engage in where we are interrogating ourselves about the ways in which we are all the time constructing false identities that will make us feel safe. Each and every day we are doing that um, and Baldwin wants us to engage in the work, and it's an endless struggle, of, of really trying to ask ourselves, are we being true? Are we, are we constructing false identities that are leading us not just to treat other people inhumanely, but leading us to ultimately um, you know, cause a kind of torment in our own soul that's not a, it's not a righteous torment, right? It's not a noble torment. Baldwin says we're all going to be tormented one way or the other. We might as well choose a noble path, which is that we're really trying to engage in something real and authentic, and also that loving another person is is not. You know, I always tell people that it wouldn't necessarily be pleasant to be loved by James Baldwin, right? Um, is that you know, like to love another person is to be willing to engage in the kind of you know, sort of to to try to help others engage in this ruthless introspection, right? To help others figure out ways in which 
you know, we are deluding ourselves. And in so doing, we are keeping ourselves from freedom and fulfillment. One of my favorite Baldwin lines, and then I'll, I'll shut up and we can, you know, we can open it up, but, uh, you know, have more conversation is, is, you know, he says that, um, he says the, the, the artist is necessarily um, at war uh, with his society, right? And he says, and, and he says, that, and he kind of explains why that is. And again, he's thinking of himself as an artist. He's also thinking of all of us as artists in our own way. But he says it's a lover's war, and love, though, is is a battle. Love is a war. Love is the kind of war that I'm I'm talking about, uh, that I was just talking about of of engaging in this kind of um, attempt to free ourselves from delusion. And he says that the the lover, the artist, you know, at his best, right, does what lovers do, and that is reveal the beloved to himself, and with that revelation, make freedom real. And I think that idea, there's a, so many beautiful Baldwin you know, words there, but that idea is so powerful. And, and, and the, the point about that politically in terms of what we do is that Baldwin is hard to pin down you know, ideologically. He was suspicious of, of, you know, he didn't want to be categorized and so on. But he, there is a sense in which he is a radically democratic thinker in this sense, right? He is saying that each and every one of us has this obligation to do in every with every means available to us to try to make the the world a place in which people love each other in that way in which we are trying to free ourselves from the delusions under which we live and we're trying to free one another and that the outcome of that for Baldwin is a more just world where more people have what they need to to pursue freedom and fulfillment in meaningful ways so sorry I'll get off my I'll get off my soapbox well and picking up on that though and Lisa and Buckley Buckley believes that that, has, that is happening for black people by 1965, right? And so that becomes a central challenge for him, Ed, which he poses to uh, Baldwin and others who, as you go into the book, somewhat inaccurately, uh, has problems with, you know, the West, the Western tradition. But Buckley does believe that, you know, we made progress, right? Because I, when I teach American political thought or race and American political thought, you know, I always tell my students, like, the Declaration, how are we doing? Like, is this real or is this just a gloss that, you know, as Buckley was saying that um, Baldwin thought? And so, you know, getting into Buckley, you know, in a world where by 1965, you know, he could debate James Baldwin, right, in Cambridge, you know, how do we square what Buckley's, Buckley's tension too, which is a conservatism which is trying to conserve something, but also adapting to a very changing world where black reality is also getting better, right? Like I wouldn't have been here in 1965 or 85, or we'll can keep the decades going. But yeah, so the question is, how do we square that as well, the reality of progress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I forgot about Buckley. Yeah, right. Buckley's part of the story. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure. You know, some uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? And so, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's really fascinating to, um, you know, just to go back to the way, you know, uh, your opening, Paul, is, is that, you know, part of what I was able to do in the book by structuring it in this way, by looking at these two guys in such depth, is, is to really, you know, think in slow motion with them and really try to reconstruct how they viewed the world and how their ideas evolved over time. And they're both so giving in terms of they're so prolific as writers, both their published writings and also their, you know, all the letters and so on and so forth in the archives. And so, and, and so to, to sort of get to your question, one of the things that was really fascinating to look at with Buckley is, you know, where, you know, where stands conservatism in February, 1965, where stands William F. Buckley in February, 1965 in the wake of, so many losses, so I, like, you know, so he had lost a lot of battles leading up to that moment. Um, he, he, you know, he thought that, you know, he wanted King, Martin Luther King to be defeated. He thought the March on Washington would be a disaster with, you know, blood in the streets. He was wrong. Um, he, he wanted to defeat the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, he, you know, he was, he lost. Uh, he, you know, he wanted Goldwater to be president. He lost. And so one of the things that was fascinating to look at is, is that, yes, Buckley is, you know, on the one hand, he's saying, look, there's progress been made. He doesn't point out during the Cambridge streets, like, I was resisting that progress every step of the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but but he does say, but he is trying to adapt in this period. And that's one of the things I found most, you know, fa fascinating um, in looking at Buckley in, in this way. You know, I sort of had the basic narrative of what I thought Buckley thought. And then I, you know, sort of dug into this stuff and, and sort of it changed some of my my views, but yeah, by 1965, Buckley is, is trying to pivot a little bit uh, away from a kind of explicitly white supremacist, uh, you know, very, you know, essentially a pro-segregationist position in the late 50s, in, in the early 60s, um, to a, a kind of new position in which he's championing things like 
a kind of colorblind way of viewing the law, right? Like he's saying, oh, wait, you know, we should, you know, now that we've achieved these goals, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be so color conscious, which in, in a way is, is part of a strategy to kind of hollow out uh, some of the achievements of the civil rights revolution. And then also what he's doing is he's trying to, as you point out, um, make, you know, the way he concludes his speech at Cambridge or one of the pieces of his conclusion is, um, is to make an argument about a kind of a bootstrap sort of argument, right? He says, look, um, you now have the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964. Um, you know, he kind of senses that the struggle for a Voting Rights Act is, you know, doesn't manifest itself until a few months later, but he knows that he's likely to lose that battle as well, given the political uh, sort of momentum. And he basically says, look, uh, he, he calls actually after the the, the, the Voting Rights Act, he calls for, a, a, there needs to be a moratorium on civil rights legislation. We just stop for a minute. Um, and in, in, in part, you know, Buckley, what he's doing in that period is really pivoting to a different kind of racial politics. He's even doing it before the debate where he's trying to sort of pick up where he can the energy that he sees in like the George Wallace movement, right? He says, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons he doesn't like George Wallace. He's a critic of George Wallace. But he, he sees that Wallace is tapping into a kind of racial resentment. What Buckley finds remarkable about Wallace's symbolic Run, you know, run in three primaries in 64 is that he's, he's listening to Wallace's speeches. He's reading, you know, the coverage and he's saying Wallace is in Wisconsin and Maryland and these places. And he's not actually saying anything about race. He's not mentioning race, but he's talking about race without saying anything. So Buckley says, this is, this is what we need to figure out. How can we tap into the white backlash? An idea that Buckley explicitly embraces in 1964 and 1965, how can we tap into the white backlash without sort of carrying the baggage of the sort of the, our segregationist past, right? So he he ends up right before the election, right? He's trying to figure out ways to to um, to tap into things like the resistance to the busing movement to achieve greater greater uh, you know balance uh, racial balance in schools. He's trying to figure out how to get a lot of liberals to support things like, um, you know, uh, you know, repealing fair housing laws, because all of a sudden that civil rights revolution is getting a little too close to our backyard. So, and so there's a, I don't want to give Buckley too much credit in terms of the kind of role he plays in this, uh, this movement of conservatism to adopt this racial politics, this politics of racial resentment, but that's part of what he does. And, and just, just to conclude this, I mean, what he, the sort of tr the pivot he makes toward Baldwin is he says at the end of the, the uh, Cambridge debate, he says, look, um, there are some individual racists out there. He uses that phrase, individual racists. Um, and they need to be convinced to not be so racist, right? Which is, you know, that's a part of the problem. But another part of the problem is what he, said, he calls failures of the Negro community. And I think this is a really important rhetorical choice. It's not an accent. He says individual racist and Negro community. Those are the two phrases that Buckley uses. And part of what he wants to do there is to draw our attention away from structural racism. Right on the one side, there's just a few bad apples out there. And then also to draw our attention to a kind of cultural explanation for, um, for a sort of failure of, of, of progress in, in, in the black community. And so um, that's something that Buckley does so masterfully in the debate itself, I think, you know, and it's something that if we turned on cable news right now, we hear the exact same sort of rhetoric, right? That's still central to our political culture. So doing this kind of deep dive with Buckley, again, not to give him too much credit or blame for what we see today, but it's it sort of thinking in slow motion with somebody like Buckley helps us understand how we got where we are and perhaps might give us a sense of what we need, how we need to change the conversation going forward. Well, and one thing that stands out about Buckley, um, which you began to allude to um, when discussing him, was you know one thing that becomes through with conservative ideas, at least since the 50s, is resentment, right? right, racial or otherwise. And it's interesting that of all people, the very privileged William F. Buckley had it, but as you can tell us a little bit more about what, I mean, not turns into a psych seminar, but what's going on? <laughs> like, right, he has always had this oppositionality to every uh, institution he had. And it's like, of all people that should not be opposed to things, the patrician should not be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really, that's a, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of, um, you know, psychoanalyzing that, uh, right. that one can do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wondering what's going on, Bill? Like, just what's happening? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually doing a talk on Thursday um, 
in, uh, well, I'll be zooming into Wisconsin and, uh, and I'll be talking about in part sort of Buckley and Baldwin and their fathers, right? Because there's a lot to talk about psychoanalyzing. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of daddy issues. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, that, that's a really, really insightful question, Paul. And I think that with Buckley, I mean, he is this kind of, the Buckleys are just a very interesting family. I mean, they, they you know, they are, um, one of the things that Buckley's brother, one of his brothers, Reed Buckley talks about is that they were, they were kind of outsiders, right? So they, they were, you know, Catholic in predominantly Protestant spaces. They were, you know, they had this estate in Sharon, Connecticut. And in that context, you know, but they're these Southerners, like by, 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 by background. And so he says, you know, we were kind of the hillbillies and, you know, in, in Sharon, Connecticut. And then they had this estate in, um, in South Carolina and Camden, South Carolina. He says, when we were down there, we were the Yankees, you know? And so they're, they're kind of, and then they're, they're America firsters, you know, before Pearl Harbor. So they have these like kind of isolationist views. Uh, they're anti FDR, you know, in the midst of FDR, you know, dominating American politics. So they are, yeah, they, they have this very interesting, there's this very interesting dynamic in that the Buckleys as a, as a kind of unit, they stick very closely together. They're intensely loyal to each other. And they have these very strong views and they're unashamed of just, you know, getting, putting those views in the faces of others in these, in these contexts. Uh, so on the one hand, there's a kind of thing, and I've gotten this question a couple of times. Um, and actually, when, you're, and when I was in your old stomping grounds, when I was down in, in, in Claremont giving a talk at Pomona, this, this came up um, is one of the, one of the questions in, in our conversation, which was, you know, isn't it kind of odd that Buckley as an outsider of sorts um, could, didn't have a greater sense of empathy, uh, than he did. And I think it, that's a, and I don't, I don't know quite what to do with that. It's true, but yeah, but I think the one of the things about Buckley is that he found it to be extraordinarily fun, if nothing else, to be kind of in the thick of the establishment and, and then, and simultaneously, you know, being the kind of, you know, to mix metaphors, like, uh, you know, the skunk at the garden party, you know, I mean, he liked that. He liked the battle. He liked to, you know, stick his thumb in, in the eye of, of, of those around him. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where he really doesn't change all that much. You know, I love his, um, you know, his response to one of his professors, it's actually his debate coach at Yale, I think is kind of very telling about Buckley throughout his life, is this debate coach at Yale says, you know, Bill, maybe you should take a, a metaphysics, there's a metaphysics, metaphysics class here at Yale, I think you'd benefit from that. And, and Buckley says, you know, I have God in my father. I, that's all I need, you know, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, there's something about Buckley uh, that's really fascinating in that regard. But, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but those are a few thoughts. But, you know, God and his father seems kind of what he was trying to conserve, right? And, yeah. much, you know, from World War II on, it seemed one of the things I think you do a great job in the book of showing is very much how if you are in Buckley's shoes, right, as Bob would have us do, you could see how a lot of things that he valued were being eroded. Um, the things that he understood, what the institutions were supposed to be doing, were gone, and so you can understand how that can then come together. By the time you, you write communism, we uh, it's so much, right? You can see how that becomes this type of what he begins to create by the sixties, and why he felt like he had to fight to protect what he valued was leaving. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, and that's that's and you know, just to to sort of stick with this theme, this Valentine's theme of love, right? Is that the kind of love that Buckley is? I hallmark. <laughs> What's that? This whole talk is sponsored by Hallmark. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, is it love? You know, love for Buckley is this kind of devotion, right? And it's and it, part of what he thought he was doing. Um, and this is comes through very, very clearly. Is that Buckley? I think he sees as his role, as his vocation, right, to defend like his patrimony, right, his inheritance is you know that this thing that his parent, this worldview, his parents taught him and that worldview, right? They teach him that worldview. Those values are what made our affluence as a family possible. They're what make American greatness possible, right? And so your job, Bill, is to utilize your, your gift, right? Your gift with language, your gift as a writer, your gift as a speaker um, to defend that worldview against all, you know, all of its, all, anyone who you perceive as challenging it. So Buckley, when he's graduating from Yale and he gives this speech to his fellow graduates, right? That's how he, you know, he frames the sort of his call to arms for his fellow graduates is that we are, we the elites, right? At this elite institution have an obligation to defend 
this, you know, these set of this set of values, this civilization. And so Buckley, one of the things he does is he constantly adopts this posture against, you know, especially somebody like Baldwin, right? At Baldwin, as you saw in the clip I played, right, he is this dangerous radical, hell bent on overthrowing the faith of our fathers. That's how Buckley frames, um, you know, the, the sort of conversation. One of the things about that that's sort of, you know, and I've gotten one of the questions I get a lot is, well, isn't it like, in a sense, it's a non-debate, right? Because Buckley, Buckley is unwilling to even listen to Baldwin, right? Baldwin speaks before him, but he's unwilling to listen to anything Baldwin said. He's just there to you know treat Baldwin as an opponent. But there's something about that in itself which is very telling. And Buckley, of course, is in some sense just a symbol of so many other things. Buckley represents something about American political culture, right? He is intransigent and he is unwilling to listen. At the end of the day, Baldwin says, you know, when he's reflecting on Buckley a few years later, um, he says that, you know, Buckley is unwilling to listen, right? He is unwilling to listen. And, and it's precisely that unwillingness to listen, which Baldwin thinks is, is fundamental. You know, that, that's kind of at the core of so much of our trouble. And again, that applies. That's not just about William F. Buckley Jr. Um, it's, about, it's about the entire culture. And that's, that's something that's still a problem, right, uh, with, with our politics today, to be sure. So that's, yeah, that's another point that I think is really important to highlight. One of the things I was wondering when reading the book, because I know we have, have, should eventually let other people ask questions, maybe, is <laughs> um, I couldn't help but reading the book wonder, how could Buckley have done this right? Right, you showed some of the other figures up there. You know, or to put this another way, what would racially responsible conservatism have looked like? Because you're right, Buckley, right, Bazell, uh, who wrote, uh, who goes wrote Concept of Conservative, right, it didn't have to be as reactionary and, you know, digging your heels at every stop along the way. So what could conservatism have looked like um, if it had been more racially responsible to what was going on? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, one and one of the counterfactuals that I, that I, you know, sort of think about a lot is, you know, uh, the Gary, Gary Wills, who many many in the audience will be familiar with, with Wills through the, his many many great books that he's written over the years. Um, he's this kind of central, you know, he's this kind of supporting character in the in the story. Um, who's this kind of protege of Buckley at the time, right? He's, he's sort of somebody who is Buckley is in some sense grooming, um, you know, to to be kind of the next generation, the leader of the next generation of conservatives. And and so one of the and, and Wills, you know, from my you know from my point of view offers a kind of much more much more sophisticated although i think wills gets baldwin wrong in a number of ways in my opinion um he's a much offers a much more thoughtful sophisticated kind of engagement with baldwin and actually did the work of reading all of baldwin before he responded to him um and so i i do often wonder what if gary wills you know had been there at the cambridge union what would that have looked like and also it's sort of easier for me to imagine you know a sort of engagement where like if if Baldwin and Wills were engaged in, in a real conversation, how they might actually get somewhere. Um, interesting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that this is a, this is a really good question. Um, and I think that one of the things that's so fascinating about this, this period is that, um, and, I, and I'll, I'll plug another book of, of you know, somebody who's, a, who's in many ways a critic of my book, which is, is extraordinarily generous of me, of, of me in this, this week of love of Valentine's. Um, Al Felsenberg, who's got a, a good biography of Buckley called The Man and His Presidents, um, one of the things that Felsenberg points out, and, and I think really powerfully, is that Buckley, in the period in which Buckley was kind of doing a lot of this work on race and civil rights, interestingly, in conservative uh, intellectuals, were far less responsible than conservative politicians. There were a lot of politicians who were actually taking much more responsible positions, and there were politicians who thought of themselves as kinds of conservative, uh, kinds of conservatives. So, um, so I, what, what would that look like? Yeah, oh, good, sorry. I want to make sure we're on time. Bob, did you oh, yeah. need some time? Because we like that we can do this forever. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, let's, let's let's open it up and we can see. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, no, trying to be polite, but I just want to make sure. Yeah, we yes, have absolutely. A little time for other people. But, I, I've just been back here taking notes, guys. I, <laughs> I was like, I got, I got more, but we do have uh, yeah, more. <laughs> yeah. No, I. Uh, this was this was fascinating. This was just really. Uh, um, let me get into the camera here. Uh, really, an amazing um, conversation, and just, I mean, yes, we did get some some uh, questions, and I want to get to those. Um, I mean, some things that that 
Nick, when you talked about Buckley listening, um, those in the audience, if you ever want to get an interesting take on this, uh, go to YouTube and watch some of the old Firing Line episodes. And there's one in particular, actually the two that stand out is when he's interviewing Allen Ginsberg, and and then when he's got Jack Kerouac. And and when you when you watch Buckley, it's kind of like he's not really listening. He's just sort of preparing his next response or his next twitch or something. Um, but the, the uh, when you talked about the Jeremiah and I, I, the thing that just immediately came to mind and I had to write it down was my dungeon shook. Right, this this letter to his nephew. And when you bring up this idea of poets, I mean, he even invoked. Oh, it's at the very end when he says, you know, you are a long line, come from a long line of poets. Um, so lots of great stuff in here. Um, so we had one question um, specifically about uh, Buckley and uh, was there any change in his thinking after the debate? Uh, it seemed like his skepticism toward democracy would lead him to reject the audience vote at the Cambridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's a, a great question. So, um, you know, just taking the the, the second part first, um, Buckley did <laughs> essentially reject the, the vote, right? So it was 544 to 164, but almost immediately he starts engaging in the work of rehabilitating, you know, what and re reimagining what happened that night. So within a couple of weeks, he uses his newspaper column. He had a thrice weekly newspaper column. Um, to reflect on the debate, and he writes an essay called The Negro and the American Dream, in which he basically says, yes, I lost the vote, but I won the debate. And that basically the students were not uh, there to, uh, to you know, listen to the arguments. The students were there to affirm Baldwin's identity. Um, and essentially Buckley dismisses, uh, you know, his loss as, as merely, he called, it, he called the debate an orgy of, a planned orgy of anti-Americanism. Um, and, uh, what's, I mean, there's a lot that's going on there that's fascinating, but he, you know, one of the things that I find especially revealing and, and is that Buckley, even within a couple of weeks, misremembers what happened in the room. Um, and so one of the things he remembers, even though it didn't actually happen, is that he remembers Baldwin getting a standing ovation before he uttered a single word. Um, and we have the videotape footage that that did not happen. But in Buckley's mind, it happened, which is really fascinating. He goes on to repeat that story about Baldwin getting a standing ovation before he uttered a single word for the rest of his life. And he repeats that again and again. But yeah, so there's that. But then on the question of Buckley's evolution after the debate, um, it's, it's certainly true. I mean, I went into the research for the book with this narrative in my head, which was a narrative of redemption for, of Buckley on race. Is that Buckley has said some really nasty racist things in the 50s and the 60s, but that he got better and he eventually sort of apologized it by the end of his life in 2008. Um, I found the, the evidence to be a little bit murkier than that narrative. Um, Buckley does, you know, say some things that are surprisingly racially progressive over the years. Um, in a couple of different instances, he seems like he's you know, sympathetic to uh, some affirmative action programs. He, he has a, a, an editorial that he writes where he says that he thinks the country really needs an African-American president by 1980. Uh, so he writes that at some point, um, I think in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and so those are kind of moments when you go, okay, this is interesting. Um, and then at the end of his life, he, he does end up uh, having a couple of moments where he says, um, you know, he's asked if he has any regrets, right? As he's getting closer to uh, to the end of his life. And he, he does, there's one line in particular uh, in Time Magazine where he says, I once believed the country could evolve its way up from Jim Crow without federal intervention. I was wrong. Um, but that exists alongside of a variety of different statements in which Buckley seems to be unwilling to say that in the moment when he was engaged in these debates in the 50s and the 60s that he was wrong. So there's something about, he says, you know, why the South must prevail is his most infamous editorial on race. It's, it's explicitly white supremacist in a variety of different ways. He, Terry Gross quotes that back to him on fresh air, you know, toward the end of his life and says, do you, do you regret this? And he says, no, I was absolutely right. Um, and even, you know, we, he's in a, a series of, um, there's a series of uh, letters from folks about conservatives and civil rights that are published in the Policy Review. Uh, which is a conservative publication in the 90s, 
And it's, it's fascinating because even Strom Thurmond seems more comfortable repudiating his former self than William F. Buckley does. So there's something about Buckley, and it goes back to Paul's question about, you know, Buckley's kind of resentment, his intransigence. Buckley had a really hard time admitting he was wrong about anything. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a debate, and this is where uh, somebody like Al Felsenberg and I disagree at the margins a little bit about this. I don't think it's a story of redemption in the end. Um, and I think there's a kind of way in which Buckley tapped into a kind of racial politics of racial resentment we see with us today. Um, but there's there are more charitable readings out there. Mm. Um, we had a question early on about uh, Giovanni's room, and I want to just quote from um, from your book, Nick. You say, at its core, Giovanni is a book about morality, although not the petty moralism of what one does in the bedroom, but rather something much more profound, the essentially human struggle to treat oneself and others with dignity. Um, and the, the question was, can you, can you comment a little bit more on that um, and, and this uh, idea of treating others treating oneself and others with, with dignity, how that fell within the um, sort of the Baldwin ethos. Yeah, thank you. Another another great question. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating. That, that book, um, for those who have not read it, I definitely encourage everybody uh, to read it. It's, it's an amazing uh, novel. Um, it's so powerful in so many ways. But one of the things that Baldwin, you know, he confronted was this question of i mean so for example he did not like the characters he didn't like certain characterizations of that book um that he thought were too superficial so one of the things he says is that um you know for example he got it was called a quote-unquote gay novel and baldwin said it's not a gay novel it's a story about uh what happens to someone when they're unable to love anyone else right and they're able to love themselves Right, and so the story of the, the love affair between David and Giovanni, that's not an accident, it's important, right? The sexual identity of David and Giovanni is absolutely crucial to the story, and I think Baldwin would admit that. But he, but he wants to try always, you know, to get to the, the root of things for him, and the root of things uh, in that case, right, is, is easy in that story, and he, 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 you know, it manifests itself in various you know, points in the plot and the characters, that, of course, the morality of what, you know, David and Giovanni how they're living their lives is something that is talked about, is something that is discussed, is something that a lot of people are fixated on. And Baldwin knew people would fixate on that in, when the book was published, right? But what he wanted to do with that is then pivot from that and say, well, let's talk about what is happening. Why is it that David is? I mean, I say in the book, you know, he is a portrait of moral failure, right? David is somebody who he, he is lying to himself. In, at every turn in that book, and in the process, destroying everyone who's ever loved him, right? And destroying himself. Like, he is he is somebody who um, is, we're just watching him, you know, I don't want to ruin it for everybody who reads the book, but, I mean, it's really a portrait of, of a character where you just look at David and you just, it's hard not to think to yourself, my God, you know, do I do that? You know, and ask yourself, like, in what ways am I like David? And, and, and you know, Giovanni is this, you know, has this whole other way of being in the world that's, I think, really powerful and important for us to think about. It. In what ways, you know, um, can, I, can I learn from Giovanni? In what ways do I need to learn from Giovanni's mistakes, for example, to not get victimized by people like David? I think that's another important lesson. But, yeah, I mean, it's really, that for Baldwin was really, that's what he wanted to do. And his third novel, Another Country, which I, didn't mention gets even more complicated where you have all these characters um, who are, I mean, really every every character in another country, in that case you have love affairs, like almost every character sleeps with every other character, um, and but everyone is broken, right, in some fundamental way. And so that novel was also extraordinarily controversial. Um, and But Baldwin was trying to say, look, I'm trying to capture something about the human experience that we can't really access unless we're willing to deal with characters that we don't like, right? I mean, one of the struggles that Baldwin had in finishing another country is he said, I really don't like any of my characters, but I have to tell this story. Um, and so I think that's that, and that captures Baldwin. That's like, you know, Baldwin and love too, right? We're going to, we're going to, part of love and part of exploring our nature as human beings 
is, is coming face to face with things we don't like about ourselves and things we don't like about each other and trying to figure out how we can become better than we are because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Mm. Um, we had a question, uh, which I think is a good way to kind of wrap up because I, I want to make sure that we, uh, we all get to bed <laughs> A decent time, but I think this is a really good. You no, know, Paul's like we can talk. Well, let's we'll carry this on afterwards, right? Um, but I think this is um, a really important question, and I and I think it really, to me, sort of touches um, on why this discussion is interesting. Um, who, intellectual errors to Buckley and Baldwin. Yeah, that's another a great question. Um, you know, and it's one that I I hesitate to sort of name names, you know, for a variety of reasons. But but yeah, I mean, I think that part of what um, you know Baldwin and Buckley give us. I mean, there's a, a couple things that, that I that I would say about it. One is that you know, in some ways, this is an odd couple, right? And, and then one of the things I I've talked about a lot with folks over the months um, since the book come out came out is that. You know, it's a weird pairing, and that what each, what Baldwin was doing, what Buckley was doing, how they conceived of themselves, their role in the world, was very different, and they were operating on different planes in a sense, right? In terms of the the kind of intellectual work that they were doing. With that being said, I think that there's a kind of there's something very revealing, right, about pairing them together, um, and and trying to assess, you know, what Baldwin took his mission to be as a writer and as a human being, and what Buckley took his mission. To to be. And so when we're thinking about their intellectual errors, I, I tend to sort of think um, in those terms. I mean, I think Buckley is one of a kind, and they're both, everyone's one of a kind, but Buckley, there's no one quite like Buckley um, in the sense that Buckley played this outsized role on the American media landscape, right? Because, you know, he had the Ma National Review magazine, which he had, you know, absolute control over um, editorially. Uh, he was the sole shareholder, and so he, he had control over what that magazine I had to say, um, for for decades, he had this thrice weekly newspaper column that was syndicated, you know, all over the place. He, in 1966, launches Firing Line, you know, as you, me you mentioned, Bob, uh, the longest running public affairs television show with the same host. Buckley was the host of that show for, you know, 33 years. Um, and so Buckley had this outsized role that's hard to imagine anyone. Uh, you know, sort of taking that kind of role in our media landscape today, right, which is so, so much more, you know, diverse in so many different ways. So, I mean, I think that what Buckley was up to, though, and then I didn't even mention Buckley was on the road, right? He was on the road 40 weeks out of the year, visiting college campuses, debating people, giving speeches, and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there's no one quite like that. And there's, of course, a lot of people that are aspiring to be like that. Um, but there's there's probably never going to be another William F. Buckley in that sense. But I think one of the things I ask people to do is Buckley had this way of performing conservatism, right? And I think that's a really important thing to think about in terms of understanding his legacy is that Buckley was in part, and I think he would acknowledge this, a performer. And he was somebody who uh, in various moments, and some of his most, you know, some of his greatest defenders will admit this, um, he was so busy, he was so active, engaging in all these different things, that he didn't often have time to think as deeply as maybe he should have, um, to reflect as long, you know, to reflect before opening his mouth or, or, or sitting down at his typewriter. And so I think especially in our world where we're tweeting, you know, and we're doing things that are really have less, less reflection than, a, you know, a newspaper column in some instances, um, there's something we can learn from that for sure in terms of how we want to engage in the world politically. And then I think Baldwin, the thing I'd say about Baldwin's intellectual heirs is there's of course a lot of people who've been mentioned as, you know, kind of heirs to the Baldwinian tradition, um, not just in, you know, sort of writing essays and fiction, but also in music and other, um, other, other forms of expression. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, the, you know, ta Hossi Coates has mentioned a lot. There's a lot of other folks um, that are mentioned as sort of part of, uh, that sort of Baldwinian tradition. But I think one of the things Baldwin, you know, what I would say is that all of us, you know, can be heirs to what Baldwin was doing in the, in this sense. And that is that Baldwin really thought that each of us as, you know, not, not necessarily as artists, but in whatever way we communicate with others, you know, whether it's in the classroom or in the library or in our interactions with our neighbor. Um, Baldwin thought that each of us 
could draw on our own experiences to, you know, and engage in that kind of ruthless introspection I talked about before, um, to engage in honest conversations with one another about the world as we've experienced it and how we'd like to experience it in the future. And so there's a kind of way in which Baldwin, um, I think, calls on all of us to be his intellectual heirs. And I mean, what you, you mentioned my dungeon shook, and maybe this would be a good good note to end on. Um, one of the things Baldwin says, that, that essay, that letter to his nephew, very famous, everyone should should definitely check it out. Um, that was a, a something Baldwin was invited to write by the Progressive Magazine um, to mark the 100 year uh, anniversary of emancipation, right? So this 1963, um, you know, the Progressive invited all these luminaries to contribute to the special issue. So you have Baldwin, you have Martin Luther King, you have all these other figures contributing to that, that, that particular um, edition of the Progressive. And one of the things Baldwin says in that, there's two things Baldwin says in that in that letter to his nephew. He writes writes in the form of this, uh, you know, letter to his 14 year old nephew, and he says two things that I think are extraordinarily powerful that, that all of us should you know maybe take take away tonight. One is uh, Baldwin has this line that you know you and I know we are celebrating emancipation 100 years too soon. Right. So you think about that and it gets it gets us thinking about 2063. Right. What does what does this country, what does the world look like in 2063 and how can what can we do now each and every moment we have between now and 2063 to make the world more free than it is right now? And then there's just one other line in there that I love. I've actually turned it into a hat. Uh, Baldwin says to his nephew, we must we must make America what America must become, right? So I love that because it's forward looking, right? He's thinking, he's thinking not about making something what it was, but making something what it must become. It's aspirational, it's forward looking. Again, he's thinking about the long term, right? He's recognizing, he knows he won't be there in 2063, but he, he you know, and he knows his nephew won't either. But he knows that that's you know, each and every moment that we have is, has to be working toward that future in which human beings can be more human to one another. So, um, so yeah, that's that's uh, a little. I'll get off the soapbox again, but that's um, those are some thoughts on that. Well, I think that's uh, that is a great um, way to wrap up um, our discussion this evening, um, and I hope that everyone watching tonight took something away that they can uh, connect with. They move through their week, and um, I highly recommend the book "The Fire Is Upon Us," uh, a, a marvelous dual intellectual biography of these two uh, really amazing individuals. Um, as you can see, I've also got my mark as we were as they were as Nick and Paul were talking. I was going back. Um, great book, Nick. Paul, thank you so much for being part of this program and for sharing your insights and um, uh, getting us to understand these uh, really amazing uh, figures in 20th century um, intellectual history. Uh, this was really a remarkable program. Um, again, uh, I encourage everyone to take a couple of minutes and fill out that uh, feedback survey. Uh, we'll have that open until 6.30 tomorrow. Um, it's a great way for us to see where everybody's from. Uh, so again, Nick, Paul, thank you so much. Thank you all thank for you. watching tonight on thank Facebook you, and YouTube. No, no. And, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see everybody back in two weeks for Walida Imarisha on the 23rd. Uh, until then, everybody have a good night, be safe, be well, and we'll talk to you later.